Okay, today is, I don't know what day it is today, 12th of August 2000. And uh, we are looking at, uh, from the east side, at the wall, east wall face of our internal wall, feature 161, and then our uh, screen wall, and the continuation of it is our internal wall, feature 160. The reason we are looking at 161 at this point is that we came down in the most of the house, uh, or at least phase 86, down to C uh, phase of the building. Uh, to these white floors that we can see all around. And uh, on the platform that I'm standing on, which is feature 169, we still have remains of the packing, very thick packing of, uh, of the D floor packing, which is the floor that was above the white floor. Now, when we look at the base of uh, the internal wall, feature 161, we can see a series of floors, these gray, lines and little bit uh, with a little bit of white plaster on top and the packing orange and brownish packing and we have series of floors that we consider to be part of the d phase on top of this platform but another thing that we can see is that the beginning of the wall or at least the wall plaster that belongs to this internal wall begins starts at the, the surface of the d floor floor uh, in the D phase, uh, meaning that the, uh, the wall belongs to that phase and is therefore a very late wall in this building. Now, um, another indication of the same comes from this corner for, from the post-retrieval pit, which is uh, feature 614, I believe. Uh, we see that the, uh, the, the platform, uh, feature 169 floors, used to go in the earlier periods from since the period um, uh, C and even before period C used to go all the way under what is uh, now on top uh, the internal house wall. So if all of these platform floors go down and towards the west then this floor can't be um, going down as well. So it has to be on top of these floors. So what we see here in this section is at least the C floor and the packing for D, and then we have some remains of D floor layers, and on top of that we see the plaster and uh, brick behind the plaster of this wall. In the continuation uh, towards the north, we can see the same situation uh, below the, the pillar, which is feature 164. And the pillar also is sitting on top of the series of uh, layers, floor layers here, uh, white layers and gray layers with orange and brown packing alternating. And uh, the, the, the pillar is sitting on top of that, on top of the D phase floors in this building. So the, this pillar, as well as the other one, presumably has been built at the same time, put in at the same time or a little later, um, but in the same floor phase as the internal wall feature 161. Enough. <laughs> uh, yes, okay. We are, we are looking at the west face of feature 161, west wall face, our internal wall. And um, in comparison with the east face, what we see here, uh, the floors are a little less uh, clearly defined than on the other side, and uh, anyway, the space 158 is, um, has slightly different um, history, uh, house history, at, the, at least at the late um, stage of the house. But what we see, we could um, identify one floor level that was our floor number one, uh, which we have removed last year, and it is unit number 6129, but it was uh, removed all the way on the floor, but not up here on the wall where, th here we have still the remains of that wall and that floor, sorry. And this is the line, actually it goes up here and we have a drawing of that. So this would be the remains of our floor number one or the latest floor in the house. At this floor, what we had in the corner was a niche uh, feature 607. Below that, the next floor that we had, which we have also removed partially, here we have these gray 
remains of it, we are already on the packing of that floor because the floor was very thin layer of gray. That's our floor two in this area. And presumably this, the, this was the floor at a time when this fire installation or this oven was in use. Now, um, that would be in a way a dirty area in this part of space, 158. And uh, clean area would be floor uh, number two in this clean area would be this white floor uh, that re remains of which we can see here going all the way up into the wall as uh, was the case with, uh, with floor number one. So this floor number two in the clean area, it was connected to the feature uh, 639, a basin of some sort, maybe a working surface. And uh, then we'll see, and then in the central part of space 158, it was connected to this white floor uh, here in the center that we will talk about uh, a little later. So that's floor number two. Under the floor number two in this area, we had a cut uh, and the fill of this cut that remains of which we can still see. That was under floor number two. So now when we look at the floor, at the wall, internal wall, we can see that we still have remains of these laid floors on them, which we are going to start removing today and then see whether um, our uh, phase D that we identified on the other side in uh, uh, on the platform, uh, 169 uh, could be confirmed on, on this side of the wall as well. And then if we look further towards the north and we look at the back of the pillar, uh, screen wall pillar, which is feature 164, we can see that in the base of this pillar we still see the white floor, which is our floor 2, goes under it. And then on top of, of the white floor we had uh, uh, rubble and very burnt remains of uh, possibly oven or something similar used as rubble and uh, put here along the wall to extend and to um, to shore up uh, the pillar. Now on the pillar on this side we can also see remains of wall plaster and this is something that will be investigated immediately. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so feature uh, 639, uh, which is connected to floor, uh, to the second floor in this space, is also connected to the wall of wall plasters. This wall is what we consider at this point to be the original wall of the house, west wall of the house. It's feature 635. And the fact that it's connected to this wall uh, indicates that this feature, so that the uh, level floor two with all its features on it, belongs to the original wall, uh, west wall of the building, meaning that just the floor one, which is the latest floor, which could be our E phase, floor phase in the, um, in the house, that that is related to uh, the late west wall and the shoring of the late west wall and to the internal wall of feature 161. So all of these features could be going, features, walls could be going with uh, the very latest phase of the house. And from this white feature and floor number two down, that would be all part of of the house that goes with a very original house wall, uh, feature 635. That's all. Okay, I'm ready. We are uh, looking now at the northern part of space 158, and we're looking at the floors. The uh, latest floor in this area uh, that uh, has, uh, that was, uh, preserved just here up close to the north wall was removed and that's our floor one which uh, we have a little bit of remains up here in the wall plasters but otherwise the floors are then removed and these are the floors that had bins on top of them and were uh, in late use 
So most likely this uh, floor one is contem was contemporary with floor one in the south of space 158. And therefore, this flow one would be also an E phase of uh, the flow phases in the house. Um, under that floor, we have floor two, which is um, this nice, um, nicely packed white floor, on top of which was our feature 171. Now, this floor two from the north is continuing also in the central part of the space. Uh, with the feature 171 on top, obviously. But uh, further south, from the center south, we actually do not have that floor preserved in the south area. We can see here in this little section that's provided to us by the gully made uh, by the rainwater, we can see that when feature 171 was in use and contemporary with the north of the um, of the space, uh, the the white floor, the floor that we find in the south space, uh, one uh, fifty eight, is below this floor. So uh, this then would be contemporary with uh, that floor uh, two in the northern part of space of the space. And then the, the same floor doesn't go down or it was not preserved or was destroyed or was maybe excavated by accident without noticing it last year. And the next floor down, which is in the southern part of the space called uh, floor two, is the floor that we see here as a white line, which goes under this floor with a feature 171 on it. So, um, also, another uh, new situation is this uh, pillar, the, the northern pillar of the screen wall feature uh, 156. Uh, we have removed all the rubble that and the shoring material that was lying around it and on, on top of it, uh, and that belonged to the uh, latest stages, uh, stage of the building. And now we are looking more or less at the original west face of the pillar. And we are also we are seeing in it that there are remains of plaster on this side, but they are fragmented, and it it was roundish. It was built of clay, that's typical uh, orange clay that we find and everywhere else. And we have a uh, uh, brick and, and mortar, brick and mortar, brick and mortar. And this most likely was the top surface of that pillar at this stage, and most likely this surface was painted. We find a large patches of the red paint that is the same uh, type and nuance of the paint as on the uh, on this um, internal wall and because we have these large patches uh, we I believe strongly that this was the original surface of it and therefore it was painted and then in the base of the pillar we can see that some of the bricks have been exposed we can see couple of bricks that go under it and we will see it probably most likely relate uh, to the early phase of the screen wall but we'll get down to it once we remove these floors okay okay today we had some sickies perhaps as a result of all that partying or at least the eating drinking whatever anyway we don't have didn't have books we didn't have Anne-Marie and we didn't have uh, Adriana. So, but nevertheless, lots has got done. Um, over here in the northeast, starting in the northeast corner, uh, we started to take down floor uh, five up there in the, here in the um, corner the uh, southern extension of um, feature 173 and here this will be the earliest floor of D, phase D, just before and then it's the earliest, it's the first floor that's done when this new extension was put on. So we're starting to take it off there in order to work up to this possible burial pit here in the middle of the east side to be able to see that better. Meanwhile 
Meanwhile, I emptied out the um, fill of feature 633, this uh, pit that's dug into the east wall um, at feature 173. And um, it's not going as deep as we thought and dreaded into the wall. And we can actually see the line of plaster down there of the east wall. So it's, in fact, the east wall is original up and down. So that's good. Um, bricks at the bottom. Uh, but it's still going back. It's still going back through there. And we're just wondering now if it has something to do with the burned soil and the oven. So here in the northwest corner of space 86, uh, Laurie and Bashak were, uh, took out the fill of uh, feature 644, as it's called now, uh, which is the burial pit, nice oval burial pit on each side of 634. Um, they took it, taken it right down, having taken the lid off and pressed it, they took it all the way down to the level, the bottom of where they'd reached with 634, and now there's a mesh, a melee of bones here. We knew this is where the basket was. That seemed, to, from what everybody's telling me, it was right here. Yeah, yeah, but I'm not talking about that basket. I'm talking oh, about the other basket. Oh, the basket that, that was, was right here, right on, the, right on this line. So right now we're here, thinking right that the there's um, the a fourth That's grave, this high. very big one, that they're going to take yeah, the plaster off yeah, yeah, tomorrow, to yeah. which may belong to this but person this down there. Either go this or, or here. There, yeah. It might be easier to go here and get the top out before we hit bottom. That's right. If we find a cut, yeah. if we don't. Just because it's easier to dig and see if we find a cut. If we don't, then we dig. <coughs> Can you see <coughs> a cut here? And then what do I here? do about units? Where, well, I mean, I've got all sorts of units going now. Okay. In the center, um, Mira has been cleaning down to this floor, the top of floor uh, level C, phase C, and also there against the screen wall. Do you have anything to say about it? Um, no, tomorrow. Did you do your video today of it, or is that tomorrow? No, I didn't. That's going to happen tomorrow. Okay. Well, she I'm was removing another floor of behind, between the Feature 613 and the south wall. There oh, yeah. The floor, there are floor levels, and she removed while well, she's getting close to the bottom of this phase. This mm. is, we are still in the D phase. D phase, there, right. We are now getting out of the D phase as she has to remove this oven, and then we'll right. be on the floor of the C phase in this area. Okay. Hopefully. Flat white surface. So, in this area, in the center of Space 158, Heidi was scraping this uh, floor here, this floor surface, white floor surface. It's feature three, uh, 639. It's feature 639. She started removing it. Is it a, what well, is, 639 is the bin thing? Is the basin thing. Basin thing, yeah. And over here in the uh, Space 85, Jim has been going further south taking off the midden next to the area where they've been taking down the bricks and taking more bricks down from over here and be working their way towards the center and here um, I think this was uh, the other Bashak was removing oh, Pager was removing um, feature 171 that's this orange basin thing that's been here since 1998 sorry to see an old friend go Bashak. Bashak's been entering this, um, clearing this, cleaning this cut here at the northern end of Space 158. Sorry, just missed that. Mira says it's full of redeposited building material. Mm -hmm. And the oven floors. Hmm. Okay, Tatlahuyuk 2000, August 12th, approximately 9.40 in the morning, 9.45 or so. This is my little video documentary of the Bach tent in relationship to the, to the mound. Um, <laughs> an attempt to get a feel for the unique lighting environment that, um, that I'm trying to 
qualify and quantify. So this is the Bach tent looking towards the north. Uh, the tent next to it is what I call and we finally named last year the Beethoven tent, which is where buildings one five are housed. It's now a museum. We'll go in there later. And again, just panning towards the west, you can see flotation down there, the heavy overgrowth that has remained from a very wet year um, with very little snow, is my understanding. There is the the dig house. You can see that we've added yet another building to it. It's ever increasing, moving even further towards, towards the west and south. Uh, you can see Mira's experimental mud brick house here and the guard house and coming around here is the mound the west area is straight straight across where we're looking right now back over there somewhere way over there the mellard area now called the south area over here you would just take this path to get there if I go a little wider, you can hopefully get a feel for just how expansive this, this mound is. I mean, it's, it's truly massive. And we'll just come all the way the rest of the way around. Like so, now we're east. And back towards the tent. So a couple things about this tent which make it challenging, to say the least. We have portals, doors, flaps that open to the north and south. The f main entrance, the way that we all come in, is is the uh, due is due east essentially. Um, you head east into the building to to enter it. And right now the light is as it is normally here in Turkey, bright, clear blue skies. Although this year we've had Lots of interesting cloud cover, and I've, I've documented that as well as I can. So the lighting in here, out here, is um, extraordinarily bright. Um, high Kelvin, the, the year I registered it, it was in the 20,000 number. So it's amazing. Come forward here. And it's I'm, I'm looking at this, this recording and trying to ascertain how I can tell you that it's just blindingly white and bright out here. Um, the difference between that and being in a shade situation, it's much cooler, much cooler light in here. And I'm hoping that the white balance of this camera will, will remain true to um, what I set it for, which was the lighting outside of the tent. So if we look now, I am looking at something on the wall that looks quite bluish. In color, the white is much more cool than um, than say the white of this tent, which is white white. I mean, the tents are obviously the same color, but um, in shade, it's it's much more cool. Now, you can, what you're seeing here, in the background is this yellow that I'm trying to <clears throat> trying to deal with on film. This is how it looks. Fortunately, now with digital, I've been able to white balance. Um, the camera to eliminate this cast and what I'm going to I'll just uh, document the tent real quick and then I will uh, hopefully demonstrate what I'm trying to describe so we've just entered the tent here's the entrance and you can see my foot here towards the north this is the tent structure and the outside north flap portal. And here is building three. Spaces 86 and 158. Spaces 89, 88, and 87. And there is the portal towards the south. An interesting artifact of the lighting of the day prior to the sun making its crest above the tent. Um, this entire wall I'll come a little closer into it. You can see the dust here lights up. Um, it is the illumination. <laughs> okay, it's our filter, 
and these are these little garbage cans are are barrels that are used um, to to hold up the tent. They're structural. Okay, so I'm going to qu take a quick documentary photograph of of this wall. So I'll be right back. Okay, this is the east wall, uncalibrated. Okay, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the camera, which will turn it back on, and by facing it towards this wall, you'll see, hopefully, a, a huge color shift. Same wall, now calibrated or white balanced by just turning the video camera on and facing it towards that wall. And there you go. So this is much closer to what I'm seeing visually, but now far too white. It's much whiter than what I, I'm actually able to see. I take my sunglasses off, which I had on because it's so bright outside. Um, but now if you take a look at the very same archaeology, the um, I, we're able to uh, document this using a digital, digital video camera, white balanced. Um, if you take a look at the ground here, things look nice and pearly white, but no matter how long I'm in here, I can never get my eyes to see what we're seeing right now with this video camera. Um, it, it's just, uh, it's just not possible. Um, this is what I've been trying to deal with for the last three years is the lighting in this, in this tent is extraordinarily flat. I don't know if it's necessarily bad light for what we're trying to do, but, but my hunch is, it, is that it is that if we could increase the contrast of the light, um, the difference between, in vision science terms, um, the background and the subject. I think our ability to see, say, the colors of things like this, um, this burial cut, uh, would just would just be far improved. So now I'm going to show a couple examples of the um, the the type of features that we're trying to document here and the type of things that we're trying to excavate and the differences um, between the approach of visual documentation and using the vision system as the uh, primary method of excavation. The painted wall, the red painted wall in space 86 above the platform. This is the red painted wall, the wall that I've been uh, also trying to document for the past uh, three years couple interesting problems with this wall. Um, for one, of course, it's exposed paint. If you look here in this corner, this area that's much darker is darkened by the conservation. Um, it's, it's not just standing from soil, it's also um, a change of color caused by the consolid consolidant that was used by the conservators. Um, the consolidant also has modified the, the ground around it and made it very difficult to excavate, is my understanding. So this is a clear, um, <laughs> a clear example of something that is excavated visually. I mean, as, as you're going through uh, one layer of material, you'll come across the paint and, of course, you'll stop. You will not go through that paint. You'll try to do your very best you can to stop. Very clear here not so clear here towards the north hand corner where the uh, the paint was much thinner it's just a very thin wash is all that's left of it and above it here the white the white plaster now also very interestingly is what we're seeing here and here is not an external face but an internal face where the paint was pulled off the wall was pulled off where the wall was um, actually whitewashed in front of it and as we came across it and pulled it 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 left like half of the paint. So what we're seeing here is the internal face of a wall that was actually painted over, painted white. This is the burial cut of uh, the platform in the northeast corner of Space 86. Burial cut. Um, quite difficult to, to document properly um, in our current condition because we can't get high enough, for example, to do a rectilinear photograph plan view. Um, also, of course, the tightness of the space. This is from a scale here, but approximately 50 centimeters um, in width this direction and about a little over a meter, maybe 1.2 meters 
in length, this direction. So that makes it a challenge, and its depth, of course, is additionally challenging. With the, uh, the burial that's in here, the goal is to remove it as quickly as possible. So all these things are challenges. Part of what, they, what um, our field recording method requires is that we do a full and extensive illustration drawing, um, diagnostic drawing of the cut, all the layers. So what I'll show you now is, an, is a prime example of um, all those layers. The small section of the burial cut showing the various layers and their colors. Okay, so the challenge here for um, is a there's a at least a threefold challenge here. There is the challenge of the excavator who is trying to define the cut itself. So going through the various layers of the platform and the floors, etc., and trying to find um, the defined shape of the cut. And one of the challenges here is that the cap that would be something that no longer exists here, but this thing that would have come across um, is you, is the same material color as the um, as the platform itself. That makes it very difficult to find. So there's that. Um, the second step, the second thing is that once it has been defined as well as it can be, and the burial has been removed, is this has to be drawn in section. And the profile here. Now I. This video camera will not do justice to the colors, I can tell you that right now. But I can also tell you that looking at it, um, you can see some major distinct um, color layers. And I'm just going to try my very best to, cut to, to document this here to show. So we have the illustration issue. Here, come on camera, you can do this. One second, let me switch to manual here if I can do that. This is fun. Okay, room for improvement in terms of editing. Okay, right here, this area that I'm looking at right now, um, this orange is an orangey color, and it goes like this and comes around like that. You can see there's an aggregate section right there. Underneath this piece of clay ball. Um, coming around, there's there the in terms of color tonality. Uh, this is a much lighter brown color here, and a much darker brownish blackish color mid-neath materials here. There's lots of little aggregates in it, like this um, piece of whatever it is rock. Uh, who can tell at this moment? And then above that would be this layer. So if I can zoom out a little bit here, Let's switch this back to auto so that thing will actually focus. Um, this layer comes around like this, and these very clear and distinct lenses of, of white plaster, followed by brown, followed by white, followed by brown. So this is the challenge is to find a way to document this in an illustration, that's a the traditional way, and also to document this on, on, uh, on film. And uh, we've, we've done a QuickTime VR of this space, and I am extraordinarily excited about, about the possibilities of using high-resolution QuickTime VR to document features like this. I think, it's, it, I, I think it has great promise, um, especially with careful um, documentation of, 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 uh, of points using the EDM. So we have these various nails in, uh, embedded in here for illustration purposes, um, leveling lines. 
and the combination of those two techniques should be very fruitful. Be that as it may, what I'm looking at is um, I'm looking at this in the, in the, at the time of day where um, the lighting coming in from the east is very good. And if we were to take a good look at, uh, I'll move back so we can kind of get it in context. Um, if we were to take a look at the west end of this, the west side, um, it's not in shadow. There is um, a general lighting, but it is it is flat. Oh, let me look at the right hole. There you go. Sorry. Um, it, the lighting is flat, but at least there's light in it. <laughs> okay. So that, that counts for something. Uh, the complexity also of trying to um, looking at the various layers on a hole this deep and this small is just trying to get in there. <laughs> just trying to get in there with your noggin so that you can actually see all of these layers. Um, it's a challenge photographically as well. In fact, with a normal camera, a camera that I cannot rotate, like I can rotate this one, this one here, but I can also rotate the screen from any angle. Um, it's, it's just almost impossible. You really have to shoot blind. Maybe perhaps with a, um, a Hasselblad, for example, would be great because then at least it would be a vertical shot. That would be potentially useful. Uh, extraordinary expensive, but potentially useful. The digital is very useful for this. Uh, let's all soil chart. North facing light. Another tool that's used extensively in archaeology is the Munsell soil chart system. <laughs> and, um, and again, based on, based on the analysis I've done over the last couple of years, um, what we're looking at visually here, compared to how we can actually document it um, on film, is just vastly different. There's, I, I don't see any real way of, of uh, correlating the color from the chart with the color that we're getting on on, a, on film or video. Um, that shot I just showed you is vastly different than what I'm seeing by just looking at it. And I will uh, take another photo of it with the digital camera a little later too, um, to, to clearly demonstrate that. But again, color is relative. So within this tent, um, the chart is being used not so much to define the absolute color, but the relative color of, of, of one layer to another. So the question becomes, does that color change throughout the day? Does the light, does the illuminant in this space, this stuff over here, this stuff over here, this stuff over here, this stuff over here, the various people that are trying to, to do this job in varying conditions, um, both proximal like this and um, in a wider context like this. How do these factors play out? Um, that's really the question. If one person is working on one, one unit, for example, um, how will the results differ than if two or three people are, are trying to do the same thing? different times of the day uh, using the same muscle chart in this tent. Is it even possible? Is it worth doing? These are my questions. Various members of the Bach team beginning work after breakfast. So one last addendum here um, for now. What you're seeing is you're seeing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine people uh, working in various parts of this tent at the same time, um, be it working for illustration in a burial hole, there's Bashak who is a human remains specialist, Lori Hager, another human remains specialist, Luchan, a new person to illustration, Laura with a, a lot more experience, she's our, our administrator of, of excavation. There's Mira, the director of the excavation, uh, trying to define to Bashak number two. Um, how to proceed in Space 158. Page in the background with labels. Um, we have Jim here who's been working this in the same unit. He's the only one who's been working in the same unit the entire time. 
uh, Space 158 going through this midden corner in the west area of the house. So all these people, different eyes, looking at different things, different colors, in vastly different lighting conditions. Um, what I showed earlier today, these, these artifacts, these barrels that um, you can see as this wall is uh, lit by morning light are, are almost gone and within an hour they will be gone and this wall will go dark. So I will videotape a little bit later on today to show how this, the lighting in here uh, vastly changes, how this wall gets, goes into darkness and the ceiling gets far more illuminated until finally the light crests the sun. That would be the light. The sun crests um, over the west side of the tent and fires a beam of very bright light um, through this hole and into the main space, Space 86, Building 3. Okay, and now I'm leaving the Bach tent. So you can see the structure here. Um, in our original model, or the original model I had conceived, you would have, well, you would have just seen the building on the mound, but obviously now with this new building here, that's vastly different. Um, let me see if this uh, building five is actually open for a second here. It's just locked for now, that that's all right. So, uh, again, some sort of scale here. Here comes Ad Adrian up the mound, we're hoping. Indeed, that's what it looks like. Okay, we have fucking, fucking, fucking video, audio, and everything else. And a really annoyed photographer. Here you are, flotation, with what's left of their shelter. <laughs> 